So, okay, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker uh, today. Dr. Martin uh, received his first degrees from Auckland University, the capital city of New Zealand, and his PhD in sociology was from the University of California. He is currently associate professor in sociology at Otago University in New Zealand. He, co he authored and co-authored numerous books on research methods and research ethics for Pearson, Oxford University Press, Rutledge, and Sage. And his latest books were titled Planning Ethically Responsible Research with CBER, the Sage Handbook of Qualitative Research Ethics with Ron Ifofen, Public Sociology Capstone, Non Neoliberal art Alternatives to Internships, Social Science Research in New Zealand with Davidson. His forthcoming book with Rutledge is Finding Your Ethical Self, a Guidebook for Novice Qualitative Researchers. I think this is the one, Dr. Tolik, that you mentioned that you just finished today, right? And uh, we will be happy if you can tell us a little more about this book. Uh, Dr. Martin has also served on ethics committees for over 20 years. And in 2008, he founded a not-for-profit independent New Zealand ethics committee. In 2012, he gained a Blue Sky three-year Marsden, Marsden grant from the Royal Society of New Zealand to study tensions around ethics review. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to bring to you Dr. Martin Tolik. He is our speaker for today's uh, virtual colloquium number five. The title of his presentation is The Strengths and Limitations of Ethical Considerations in Focus Group and Face-to-Face -face Interviews. He will speak for more or less 40 minutes and the rest of the time uh, hopefully, like 10 minutes, we can have the question and answer. All right, Dr. Tolik, this is your time now. Right. I will stop sharing my screen so you can share your screen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for this opportunity to um, to stay up late. I usually go to bed at nine o'clock at night, and this is nine o'clock at night. So if I start to start to drop off, you know, just sort of <laughs> sort of uh, ask me some loud questions or something. But uh, I go walking uh, in the morning at about five thirty. So uh, that's that, that's my um, that, that's what I. Uh, that's my normal day. So well, welcome to my office. I'm in my office. I don't have a screenscaper behind me, but this is just my office. And I just wanted to point out um, to you a, a picture on the wall um, over, over here. And um, it's a, of, a, of a prime minister of New Zealand. Um, his name was um, uh, Michael Savage, or everyone called him Mickey Savage. And he was the prime minister of New Zealand between 1935 and until his death in 1940. And he, he was the person who was the founder of the welfare state in New Zealand. He created the welfare state. And he, he always saw, just to fit in with, with the theme of today, today's early presentation, uh, he, um, he always saw the welfare state as applied Christianity. And as a child, as a child it, growing up in New Zealand, I would go around um, to people's homes and they would have this picture up on the wall. He was the saint. He saved us from the depression. So I just wanted to uh, sh share with you, what, welcome to my office and welcome to my world. I want to talk about the strength and li uh, limitations of ethical considerations and focus groups and face-to-face -face interviews. I want, to, I want to look at those two in particular and the two concepts that I want to play with today is one is confidentiality and the other is process consent. But first of all, um, I just wanted to 
I'm very unusual in the world because um, I've never met anybody quite like me who actually owns an ethics committee. People, people serve on ethics committees or uh, make applications to an ethics committee, but I'm the only one who actually owns one. And I, in, in 2008, I set up the New Zealand Ethics Committee, and it's a committee that serves uh, non-government uh, organizations, government, uh, uh, and also government uh, agencies, and also community researchers, people who, who don't have access to university ethics committees. And it just gives people a chance. So I'm, I'm really a big supporter of ethics committees. And I need to say that because I'm also a great, I'm also a, uh, a critic of, of ethics committees because ethics committees have limitations. So when you go to an ethics committee, there are three questions that they can ask you. The first one they'll ask you is, well, what is your research about? The second question is, what are the ethical issues raised by your research? And the third question is, how will you address those questions? Every ethics committee in the world asks those questions. But for qualitative researchers, those questions are not good enough, are, are, are not enough. What qualitative researchers need to um, uh, uh, need to do is to be asked the question: What will you do when your research question and this approved ethical assurance is changed? Because we're using an emergent iterative model, our research question changes because we're informant led, and and also um, and because that research question changes, so too do our ethical um, considerations. So I wrote this article with Maureen Fitzgerald in 2006, if ethics committees were designed for ethnography. And this was in a great journal, the Journal of Empirical Research on Human Research Ethics. And it was actually uh, volume one, number two. So it was right at the start of this great journal coming out. So for the last 14 years or so, I've been asking the same question, what do qualitative researchers need to do to, to practice their, um, their ethical considerations, knowing that the research question is changing and the ethics is changing with them? So when you look at the, 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 the books that I, that I, that I um, have been um, writing, one of them with, with, with uh, Joan Sieber, if you look at the title of this book, Planning Ethically Responsible Research, and what we need to be doing is, sure, we go to an ethics committee, but now we need to plan to be ethically responsible, and we need to take responsibility. And so the whole talk today is about qualitative researchers are different, and they're different in that they have to be always looking out for um, the ethical issues that, that, that arise, especially around confidentiality and especially around con consent. So um, about an hour ago, about an hour and a half ago, I sent off 12 chapters of a book. Uh, and this was the book that I just sent off this, this, uh, this evening. So I'm really excited. Um, and it's, um, it, the book is called Finding Your Ethical Self, a guidebook for novice qualitative researchers. So uh, I can um, um, hear, here I'm saying to the reader, you need to find your ethical self. And so I'm just going to show you a little exercise. Um, this, this book basically got sent off today. It's, it, it was a revise and resubmit. So it, it's, in its, in its in its last form. But I want to show you, I want to show you the first day of my class. And uh, about four years ago, I sat down with some postgraduate students and I had this thing in my hand. It's called a, it's called a, uh, it's called a audio re recorder, and I want to show you what I did with this. And I want to show you what I did with this tape recorder. So I've, I've got a little cartoon that I want to show you. Um, so here we are. There's five students, five postgraduate students, and I'm. I've never met them before in my life. And I say, welcome to qualitative research ethics in your first day in graduate school. As you can see, I've turned on the audio recorder. So let's begin. And I start talking about the assignments and stuff like that. And then this person over here says, hmm, don't you need our permission to turn that thing on? And I say to that student, why would I need that? And this other student says, I think she wants to know if you need our informed consent. And I say to the, the all five students, wow, 
all this eth ethics in less than, less than 60 seconds. So what I was saying to those students, what I was assuming about those students is they came into my class and they knew a lot about ethics and I just needed to, I just needed to bring it out of them. And I, I, I wanted them to speak up and they did. Uh, hmm, you don't, do you need our permission to turn that thing on? Um, and I think she wants to know if you need our informed consent. So these people were not only had ethical ideas, but they had the willingness to speak up and say to a person in authority, hey, this is not right. And I said to them, wow, all this in less than 60 seconds. You know what I did next? The next thing I did is, hey, let's write a journal article together. And, and, and here, these people sitting ar ar around the room are Louisa Chow, Adam Dosberg, uh, Amy, Amy Foster, R Rachel Shaw, and, and uh, David Wither. And we wrote an article about this and about this whole course and about how, how I taught um, the students um, research. Well, I didn't teach them anything. They taught me research ethics. So... Um, what I'm saying here is qualitative researchers need to be trained to be able to identify ethical issues, but more importantly, have the courage, have the courage to say, hey, that's not right. And they did in this, in, in this case. So, um, so that's my, that, that's the start of my, uh, that's, that's the first page of my book that I just sent off today. So let me get back to the talking, the talk that I promised that I would, I would give and talk about the strength and limitations of ethical considerations. Um, first of all, I wanna talk about confidentiality. And I wanna say that confidentiality is, is really a fundamental issue for qualitative researchers. And when I talk about confidentiality, I wanna talk about the, its strength, but I also wanna talk about the limits of confidentiality. And a few years ago, I wrote an article um, called uh, 2004. I wrote an article about internal confidentiality, when confidenti confidentiality insurance assurances fail. If a researcher interviews family members, fellow workers, or a member of, of a small town, the threat of confidentiality is not by strangers. The real threat the real harm to confidentiality is from the fellow residents, the occup occupants and the workers. And um, so I often, I often use the idea of, okay, let's do a research project um, and let's go out to five schools in, in the Philippines, five schools, five locations. And the good thing about five locations is that we can, we can write about them and we, we have a degree of confidentiality. But what, what happens if four of those schools get flooded out or four of those schools say, no, we don't want you to come to our, our class, our school anymore, and there's only one. And there's only one. So I tell, I ask my students, I ask the students who are sitting around the room, what happens then? And they will tell me. The problem with that is that when you have one, um, one location and you're writing it up, no one's going to know what school you came from. I mean, and I call that external confidentiality. And that's not really important. No one knows the name of the school. What's really important is the threat to internal confidentiality. And that is that people, when you write that report and, uh, and you talk about a trade unionist or a receptionist or a CEO or, or a specific person, um, people will actually recognize themselves. So I, I present this to a, a, a hypothetical case to my students. And I sort of say, this would never happen in real life. But it happens all the time. So it happened in, in, in Street Corner Society. It's my favorite example of it in Street Corner Society, that great um, anthropological study of the social structure of an Italian slum by William Foote White. And White gave pseudonyms to the region. He called, he called the region Corneville and the inhabitants. He named what one person Doc. So he's thus protecting people from an, an, uh, external confidentiality. But participants told White about the insiders recognizing themselves and others um, in the text. And 
Doc or Pessy, this is one, one of the insiders, he did everything that he could to discourage local reading of the book, Street Corner Society, because William Foote White gave copies of the book to the local library. And this was incredibly embarrassing for people like Doc, who was mentioned in, Doc is the main character in the book because it actually could, could cause um, uh, harm to, to, to Doc and, and, to, and to the other gang members. So he used to go every week, he'd go and actually take the book out of the library. Now that's, that's a one-off case, so, um, but it happens all the time. Here's, here's a case um, in Carol Alice's book, uh, Fisher Folk in the Chesapeake Bay. And, and it's a wonderful article, it's a brilliant article in 2007, talking about ethnography. And she's talking, she's talking about going back to a fishing village that previously she had actually studied. And she, 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 she went back to this group of people who were completely illiterate. But someone had read the book to um, these people and the residents were outraged. They were outraged about how, how, so this, this is an example of internal confidentiality because, and so they use pseudonyms, but the pseudonyms they used to secure confidentiality had failed to work and the key informants felt that they could identify themselves and others. And Alice reports in that article, it's a brilliant article, the, 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 the residents felt that the book had made them look stupid. And that's, that's important ethically because that's harm. We've actually harmed our participants and we've done it by, by not actually providing real genuine confidentiality with the people. Um, so, okay, let's give a third example. I love these examples. This, this, this one's uh, Vidic and Bensman, small town and, and mass society. Uh, this, is, this was a very, very important book. And the people of the village of Springdale waited quite a while to get some sort of uh, uh, comeback on Vidic and Bensman because in the book, all these people were given pseudonyms, but everybody worked out very quickly who everybody was. And they had a float in the annual 4th of July parade, which fe featured an authentic copy of the jacket of the book, Small Town and Mass Society. And following the book came the residents riding, in ma uh, riding masks in cars labeled with fictitious names that the authors had given them. But the payoff, the payoff, these people were very angry, but the payoff was the final scene, a manure spreader filled with a very rich barnyard fertilizer over which uh, there was a uh, there was an image of the author, so people were were very very angry. Here's my last example from uh, from Ireland, uh, and this researcher, this anthropologist, um, she did a study of mental health in an Irish village and gave everybody um, pseudonyms. But when she returned uh, to the site of the 1979 study that was about 10 years later she went back to the to the to the town uh in this isolated village she found that all the villagers had deciphered uh all of the pseudonyms and she, she described um the, the use of pseudonyms as being really ineffective she said i'd be inclined to avoid cute and conventional use of pseudonyms that is not that that is not not good ideas so um um so uh, in, my, in my book that I just sent off an hour and a half ago, um, I come up with all of these hypothetical uh, puzzles um, that, uh, that, that, that can be uh, compared to these actual cases. But here's one that I'm not gonna give an answer to, but you might think about it. What would you do in this situation? There are methodological and, and um, um, ethical implications of research when you interview, say, married couples. And, and you talk to married couples about their spending habits. My goodness, if you talk to my wife and myself about our spending habits, you'd find something really interesting. So, so this is a methodological problem and an ethical problem. Does the researcher, this is a methodological question now. Does the researcher gain more information from each person by interviewing them separately or together? So that's a methodological question. But what are the internal confidentiality implications if the couple is interviewed separately? Maybe you'll get better data. You'll get, you get better data if they are separated. 
But if you put them back, if you put them back into the case, into a into a study, and you re report on that, will they be able to recognize each other? And what is the potential harm of that? So I'm I'm always sort of questioning what is the harm. Um, so um, if I didn't know the answer to that question, and um, uh, but that, that's a really good question to, to talk about in a, in a research methods course and an ethics course because, because th there's lots of answers. There's no right answers. Um, but what, would we, what we would be doing would be forming some sort of a reference group. And that's what I think we should do is once we go to an ethics committee and they give us their, 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 their um, opinions on, on our research, then we go out in the field, our research questions change. Is there someone that we can talk to? And that would be a reference group. And I, I would think that that would be a re really good group, uh, thing to, to do. So um, form a reference group, just a people, group of people who aren't involved with your research, dispassionate advice to think outside the box. Um, and here is an example of, of one. I expect that you'll have copies of this slide, so I'll just talk to the slide here. Here's, a, here's um, two researchers, Rosalind uh, Edwards and Weller. They're doing a study of rural youth in Britain. And they are doing a longitudinal study, and they talk to um, these young boys at the age of 11, 14, and 17. And um, they had a they had a reference group, but something happened, and Gilliman and Gillam um, call this a big ethical moment. They 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 interviewed Dan at the age of eleven and fourteen. They came back to interview him at the age of seventeen, but he had passed away. Should the mother had access to the data? We could, we could, if we, if there's 50 of us listening here, we could have a, we could have a very lively uh, reference group right now. I'm not saying that there's a right answer, um, but some people may say, of course, the mother would want the, want the transcripts and also the audio tapes, um, uh, uh, so they could, they could actually relive uh, Dan's life again. But then there's some people out there will say, no, 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 Dan, Dan. You have to respect the principle of 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 consent that Dan gave. That he gave he gave he gave the information to the researchers, not 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 to be shown to his parents. And and also, what what if he said really negative things about his mother or father or siblings? That could harm people. So you can see how a reference group would be really useful here. So there's no right answer, but. But there's a there's a there's a chapter in a book that I um, I'm edit, edited uh, on qualitative ethics and practice by Edwards and, and Weller. Um, it's a really really good one. Uh, it's a really great answer to a um, to a reference group. So I've been talking about internal confidentiality uh, here. And um, I, I now want to move to talk about sort of, comp I want to talk about consent. Um, and, but I think when, when I give you this next case, um, you're going to be thinking about confidentiality, but I don't want you to be thinking about confidentiality, confidentiality anymore. I want you to start thinking about consent. Con confidentiality is not the answer. So here's this, Here's this case that's come from McFarlane. So I give students my this this case, and I say what what should happen. Um, so um, I'll read it out. Uh, I'm this this is a researcher. I'm, I'm doing a multi-site case study where, in a small number of institutions in a small country, where the number of in, such an institution is, is relatively small. In, in spite of my best efforts to anonymize my sites, projects, and respond, respondents, any informed reader would have little difficulty identifying the sites, even the individual responses. Um, I'm assured by others that these 
people given their professional roles are not naive and have verified their transcript and in, in full knowledge of my intention to cite or quote them. Let's go to the next. Uh, as a consequence, I have decided that each individual respondent will verify and amend if necessary their own transcript. I'm reluctant to rock the boat. What the hell does that mean? I'm reluctant to rock the boat um, by exploring into much detail unless asked uh, what they actually understand by anonymity. I've spelt it out in writing and they seem to realize that what they're signing up to still, this keeps me awake at night. When this thing, when this keeps you awake at night, you know that there's an ethical dilemma going on here. And you, are, you don't want to rock the boat. I'm reluctant to rock the boat. And I'm saying to you, let's forget about confidentiality. Let's forget about anonymity. What needs to happen here is consent. And the, the, it, it's a form of consent. It's a form of consent um, um, that is called process consent. So what the person needs to do is to actually go back to the person, go, go back to these people, forget about confidentiality, forget about anonymity, and just ask them, do you still want to be in this project? Do you still want to be in the project? Do you consent? So we have informed consent when we start off the project, but process consent is ongoing consent. And uh, process consent really comes from this uh, wonderful article by Carolyn Alice. So pro process consent is an active form of consent taking the participant's right to withdraw beyond a passive construction. So rather than leaving it up to the participant to withdraw at any time, the researcher re repeatedly invites the participant to volunteer in each part of the research. And that's what process consent is. It's far better than informed consent. So I'll, I'll give you some more examples of, of this. Um, so with pro process consent, the person has the right to withdraw um, and it's, and it's actually a stronger form of consent than informed consent. Um, and I, I wrote an article a little while back on, on um, narrative research. And I think you'll see the problem uh, that narrative researchers have with the idea of process consent. So Josselson labels informed consent a bit of an oxymoron given that the participant at the outset has only the vaguest idea of what they might be consenting to. So with narrative research, you start off with one interview and then you have another interview and then you have another in interview. Um, and um, by the time you get to the third interview, you've, you've left the, the left, uh, the, the original consent way, way behind. And, but then Josephson goes on to say, uh, um, and I'll have to read this because it's uh, blocked out for me. Um, with some candor, Josephson says process consent strikes terror into researchers because it means what, what it says. So what I'm suggesting with that case study is that the researcher could be losing sleep because offering process consent meant perhaps losing data. And that's a risk that the, that the researcher must, must bear. Um, so I just, I've lost track of the time here. I don't have a clock up here. How, how am I going for time? You're, You're okay. good. You're good, doctor. Okay, uh, cool, cool. You okay. can go up to 5.50 and we still have 15 minutes more. Oh, wonderful. Great, great, great. Um, so, so what I want to, um, what, what I want to do is um, is that we we need to um, uh, practice process consent. Um, so we we invite someone to be part of our our, our our research. We and we interview them. And at the end of the research, you say to them, "Are you happy to stay with us? Are you are you are you happy? Do you want to be part of this research going forward? Would you like to leave and leave the project?" Uh, that's what that's what's called process consent. It really expands on participant observation. I mean, the participant autonomy, and the participant, not the researcher, decides uh, who is to um, 
stay in the project. And this situation is not unusual uh, in qualitative research. And it really requires the, the researcher to take responsibility for the safety of the people who are part of their research project. And that's what, that's what we need to do in qualitative research. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's, something, here's, here's something that you might get into your next methods question, uh, but methods uh, 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 ethics um, seminar. Are there any ethical considerations in focus groups? Um, I'm going to I'm going to start off and be provocative and say there are no ethical um, assurances in focus group. There are no ethical assurances in focus groups. There I, I said it right at the top there. Focus groups have no ethical assurances, and that's what I I wrote an article in 2009. I've been doing this for a long time. The, pr the principle of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware that, hey, there are no ethics uh, involved here. So what, what, what ethics could there be? There could be, <coughs> there, there could be confidentiality and there could be informed consent. Those two, th th they don't exist in focus groups. Because when you get into a focus group with a bunch of six or seven people, uh, I can tell them, I can say to them, whatever you say here, I won't repeat to anybody else. That's called external confidentiality. But I have no control over the people who are in the room. That's internal confidentiality. There's no, there's no, nothing to stop them from going and sort of gossiping of what, what they actually heard. So to be proactive, to be proactive, you need to say to people who come to a, um, a, a focus group, you need to respect other people, but you need to respect yourself. And don't say anything in a focus group that you wouldn't say in a public meeting, like in a high school, you, you go to a high school parents meeting or something like you get up and you sp say something. You need to think of a focus group like that. I'm, I'm really being quite honest here and sort of saying that because of internal confidentiality, uh, there is no confidentiality. Um, and the second, the second thing is about consent. The great thing about the great thing about um, uh, focus groups is group talk. And that's my, uh, that group, group talk comes from a, uh, a scholar, a friend of mine named Marianne Carey, um, what was the person who came up with the idea of group talk. And what she likes about group talk is that people bounce off ideas with each other and topics develop and redevelop and and it's a bit like the um, the narrative research. We start off with a topic and it gets retopic and repurposed and repurposed. And before long, <coughs> before long, we're actually talking about things that were not actually promised. So in terms, there are limits in terms of consent. Once again, once again, we need to use solutions. And solution is thanks for taking part in the, in the meeting today. Um, are you are you still happy for me to sh to to use the material that you personally said? That's process consent. And before the meeting, you would say, to, and you would tell everybody to uh, that th this is, treat this like a public meeting. So you can actually empower empower you, your participants, give them all autonomy, give them agency um, that they can um, they can uh, they can they can use. So I'm getting to my last two slides here. Um, qualitative re research, that fourth question, um, it's not just what your research is about, tell me about the ethical issues and how you're gonna deal with those issues. What are you gonna do when you get out in the field and your research questions change and the ethical issues change? The answer is have a re research, have a reference group have a reference group that you can go back and talk to. And um, so um, this means that the researcher is solely responsible for the um, protection of participants who volunteer to take part in their study. Process consent, the burden of responsibility for risk can be shared with the participant um, and, and that they must be given the opportunity to withdraw. So what I've said to you today is two ideas. 
beware of internal confidentiality. It's really in our, our in New Zealand, we, we would say fucker papa in, in our history, in our genealogy. If you want to go back and understand qualitative research, you have to understand internal confidentiality. And people have been harmed by the, the absence of confidentiality assurances. And the second one is about consent and basically practice process consent and, and give people the opportunity to withdraw and take a risk and they may leave and that you you'll lose the, lose their data but you but you won't lose their respect and they they won't that they won't be harmed right that was meant to be my last slide but um so i'm re really thrilled that about two hours ago i sent off 12 chapters of a book to rutledge in england and i'm pleased that that that's a way so now i get to start a now i get to start a new project uh with my new colleague and we are coming up with a with a a, a future research, uh, like a little uh, called practicing qualitative research ethics in the field. And we are going to um, we are going uh, via the um, Asian Qualitative Research Association with a with a message in a bottle and saying, "Hey, researchers out there, um, what big ethical moments have you had?" in your research experience in the field um, that neither the ethics committee nor yourself predicted in, in research design. Um, and, and most importantly, tell us how you dealt with it and address the issue um, and in, in sort of creative ways. And if, if we can actually learn from each other uh, that we are very creative um, and uh, so that's my that's my next research project, and I'm going to um, uh, stop there. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we should give a big hand to Dr. Tolik. Can you please? Uh, we can't see, you know, our uh, other participants, but Dr. Tolik, thank you very much, and they are. Uh, sending their greetings to you here in our chat box. We are very grateful. So this is now time for our question and answer. And I'm happy that we have, I think we can go for 15 minutes. Yes. I now turn over the time to uh, Dr. Pavel and to Dr. David for the question and answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Tolik, for this insightful presentation. I think it raises uh, uh, many questions, and uh, I believe we have uh, um, fairly enough uh, questions to entertain now, but I, would, I wanted also to ask, uh, on a personal basis, uh, ethics is something related to our world, personal, um, in, um, our education, maybe um, some personal traits, some, some personal features. Um, the, the committee not really ensure if you are going to follow that ethic that you wrote down in your document. So there should be something more to that um, as uh, to train our researchers uh, or to have some way of, uh, you know, um, um, designing a sort of uh, know a training or something on ethics uh, that will be cross-cultural because in different culture ethics can be different uh, in some cultures uh, confidentiality is nothing so people just know each other and they they, they don't so much uh, think of of that uh, issue on so what would you say about this maybe there are some books to consider or some you know uh, from your own experience, um, speaking of, of uh, ethical behavior um, in general. I, I think this journey that I'm about to start now, um, I, I, I've just joined Facebook. I've just joined Facebook. Um, that's a cultural experience in itself. And, uh, and the only reason I've joined Facebook is to join your association. Mm -hmm. um, and now, <clears throat> now I'm getting bombarded by fam from family and friends to, to, to be their friend. So uh, anyway, so I, I'm, I, I'm off. Uh, 
I really want to, I think when I, when I start researching in Asia, uh, I, I, think, I think we're going to come across different forms of ethics review systems. We're going to come across with different ethics and we're going to have, we're going to have different, different practices. And, and I, I hear you about confidentiality and uh, uh, that, that, you know, I think, uh, I think we need to be, um, we need to be reflexive and, 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 and so that we actually can integrate um, the, and, and be responsive to the cultures that, we're, that we are uh, with. I think ethics committees do a great job, uh, especially with qualitative research, but they, they need to know that um, our research questions will change. Uh, uh, and, and, and what we need to be doing is, and I, that's what my book is about, is training, training novice, young qualitative researchers to, to have the uh, skills and the courage the courage, especially to 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 address ethical issues that actually emerge in their in their field. When you look at that quote about the woman uh, who was um, uh, who was saying, um, I, "I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to rock the boat." You know, you know, it's sort of like that's sort of. I wouldn't want any of my students to say that. Uh, I would want my students to to get in there and actually solve the problem. Um, not for themselves, but for the people who are in our studies. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes, I think we have uh, many questions coming in, uh, so we can start. Uh, uh, Sir David, can you start to share the questions? Sure, okay. sure. Uh, I'll ask my questions when all the other questions are uh, are answered already, because we don't have more time. Uh, Dr. Tolik, uh, can you uh, stop share so I can share uh, some questions? Thank you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> there are still more questions coming in, uh, but uh, this is these are some of the questions that I have have transferred to my uh, PowerPoint. So, here's a question by uh, Jeanette Espada. How do we remove identifying characteristics without sacrificing the quality, clarity, richness, or depth of the research context? That's um, that's a really good question, Janet. It's a really good question, and i i want to I want to use the word de-identify. I, I think you're trying to de-identify, and I like the word de-identify. Uh, and you're not using the word to anonymize uh you're using the word de-identify and and that's that's the good that's the good word um you know that's the price that's the price we pay for looking after our people uh who who uh, that's the sacrifice that we will we pay the the way to get around that janet is to is to um um try and take some of the identification away uh, and but give it give the quote back to the person and say does this have I gone far enough that's another example of process consent um, but I but I, I understand what what it is that you're actually saying um, um, yeah that's that's it you know I'm I, I don't think we need to come up with the answers uh, Janet I think I think um, that's a that's a great question. It's it's a great question for a reference group, and um, and uh, and I I think I, I think sharing your data with your uh, informants or participants would be uh, allow them to uh, um, to say what 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 is revealing or not. But it's a good question. <clears throat> Yes, uh, thank you. Here's the next question uh, by uh, Dr. Prema. Uh, <clears throat> she's saying thank you uh, for mentioning the concept of a reference group for helping decide when facing ethical dilemmas. How does one go about using this support? Does the researcher count on the majority vote and mention that in the study, or is there another way to do it? <clears throat> Yeah, I I don't like uh, 
pre prima, I, I don't like the word majority vote. Uh, I, uh, in ethics, we're always about consensus. Let's talk about it until we get to a consensus. Um, there's an article. There's an article by Pollard, um, a 2007 article, but by Pollard, who talks about postgraduate students um, uh, wanting to have a re reference group, but not with their supervisors because they they've made mistakes and they don't that they that they don't want to go to the supervisor and, and to be shown up as as sort of being incompetent or something like that. So. Uh, how does one go about getting a getting a focus uh, getting a reference group? It's just you know a, a, among your cohort, you can actually be your own reference group, and and it's if especially if it's uh, if it's the same level, uh, people can be supportive of, of one another. But we're not looking for a majority vote. We're looking for a, a consensus to to understand what is the best way forward. Thank you. Another, another great question. Uh, here's one for uh, Ranjit. Um, <clears throat> he's saying he's, he cited you in several papers. Uh, this is the question. Having served for many years in ethics committee, do you think blind review of the documents submitted for ethics review is appropriate ethically by the ethics review committee? Yep. If otherwise, could need to bias review over the document? Well, some, some ethics committees, um, some ethics committees allow the person to attend the meeting. So that's not blind. Uh, and some, some are, are blind. Um, um, I think ethics committees try their best to be um, not biased. Um, there is a there is a sense there is a sense among qualitative researchers uh, internationally that qualitative re research is not quite understood by ethics committees. So so there is a there is a sense of sort of uh, a bias. And Van der Hoonard, uh, Will Van der Hoonard wrote a two thousand and one article called "An uh, Ethics Review as a Moral Panic." Um, so um, 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 so. Your there's a lot of basis. There's a lot of basis to your bias um, question here, and I, I'm delighted that, that that you get to meet me face to face. That's that's so nice. Thank you very much. Uh, David, may yes. I ask a question to uh, follow up on that one? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Tolik, uh, uh, the challenge of qualitative researchers is that they submit their uh, proposals to ethics committees that are shall we say, a uh, majority of those sitting there have the quantitative orientation. Uh, would you suggest that in a university, for example, there are two ethics review board, one for quantitative research and another for qualitative research? What do you say? I understand the question and uh, that that's a good solution. The other solution is just to have, just to have, um, just to have a couple of qualitative researchers on the ethics committees, and when when these sort of very odd phrases come up, come up like lived experience or uh, a, 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 a snowball sampling, and can, the person could actually speak to the application, speak to the concept. So um, yes, you can have a, a separate ethics committee. Um, there are I've written I've written papers on 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 different models of, of ethics committees. Um, and so at, at your university, is your ethics committee more of a quantitative biomedical model or? Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, <clears throat> Another question uh, from Alicia. Is it unethical to get qualitative data from people's posts in social media? How do we address this? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I, I, I'm actually just, my, my students are just reading, reading this at the moment. There's a, 
a woman named Elizabeth Buchanan. Elizabeth Buchanan is the person who, um, who, uh, and she's got an article. If you if you go Elizabeth Buchanan online uh, Stanford, you'll come up with her latest code of ethics, um, and she she answers that question far better than than I can. Um, uh, people's posts in the social media and and. Yeah, it's actually a, a, a it's a it's a really good question, um, but it's too complicated to uh, uh, to to answer in 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 less than five minutes. So I'll 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 have to just Elizabeth Buchanan is is the person that you want, and I, I might uh, I, I might make a list of um, some citations that I I like with um, with Pollard and and Buchanan, and I'll pass that pass that on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to our participants, do not worry. Uh, we have uh, a conversation with uh, Dr. Tolik that uh, he can even give to us materials to read and we will upload in the APRA FB uh, page. <clears throat> Thank you, Doctor. Uh, another one. Uh, is process consent acceptable? for the standard of ethical consideration? I'm not too sure about the word standard of ethical consideration, but it, 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 is, it is really acceptable. It's good practice. It's good practice. Um, but go back to that Josselson uh, quote, and, and, it, and it, strikes, it strikes terror in people because you just finished an interview and you say, are you still willing to take part, uh, to take part in my research? They can say yes or no. Um, so uh, it's a it's a real risk, but I don't know if it's standard, um, but it's certainly a good idea. This is like my oral exam. Do, 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 I get to, do, do I get a PhD from your university at the end of this? This is these are really these are really good questions. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, maybe we can accommodate like two questions more, David. Okay, um, maybe this one then. Uh, sorry. So, in the wake of COVID-19, should we allow research data entry remotely? Data safety and ethics on one hand, meeting deadlines and remaining productive on the other. Should researchers always seek informed consent from participants and consider scenarios where informed consent is neither practical nor desirable? This is a long question. No. Okay. So, um, so in my book, in my book, uh, uh, where informed consent is neither neither practical nor desirable, I, I give an example of um, virtual reality. So I'd like us all to take part in a virtual reality test. And all I can tell you is they're going to put goggles on. Uh, you put goggles on, and you're going to have a virtual reality. But I'm not going to tell you what you're going to be doing. Uh, in the in the experiment because that would that would so so in, in a sense in a sense I actually haven't given you a full informed consent but if you go to the Nuremberg code the Nure oh by God we're talking about Nuremberg code article 9 of the of, of the Nuremberg code basically states that uh, you need to allow a research uh, participant the right to withdraw at any time and I think so. If you if you can't give a full and in, 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 in informed consent, you need to empower the participant to say yes. At the end, you you can leave us at any time. And look at look at the Milgram experiments and look at the Zimbardo experience. Uh, experience those people weren't allowed to leave. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Asel, do we still have time? I think there are a couple uh -huh. more. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, one more. One more. Uh, this is from Mr. Samuel. He's asking, what, what is your take on ensuring ethical concerns in appreciative inquiry design, which mostly demands focus group discussions or interviews? I'm sorry, I can't answer that question because I don't understand appreciative inquiry. Uh, Dr. Tolik, it's a design where uh, mostly the, the data comes from focus groups. So the question maybe is uh, uh, just like what you said, in focus groups, we really cannot 
give assurances to our participants regarding internal confidentiality? Yes, I, I, in that article that I, that I quoted, I, I actually have a statement that should be read out uh, 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 before a, a meeting uh, about saying, you know, this is a public meeting and um, you need to respect other people's uh, opinions. And if you want to withdraw from the study at any time, you can. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, back to you, Dr. Hassan. Oh, these are great yeah. questions. <laughs> Dr. Tolley, can you please uh, expound your, uh, your take on anonymity? Can even in uh, not in a focus group uh, mode of gathering data, can we assure our participants anonymity for any type of data collection? Okay. So the answer to that question is, is this thing here. It's called the Oxford Dictionary, um, the concise Oxford. And if you, look up the, if, if you look up at the answer, if you look up anonymity here in this dictionary, it basically says un unknown, that, that it's of unknown source and you, it's unnamed. And I think that's what, the concept of, that's what the concept of anonymity actually means. And... Um, and uh, a qualitative researcher, what I would have said in Porto, the qualitative researcher can never be anonymized. It has to be confidential. So what we as qualitative researchers need to know is our concept is confidentiality, not anonymity. Mm -hmm. And there are limits to um, anonymity through internal confidentiality and also uh, through the subpoena. So uh, that the police can actually subpoena our data also. So there's real limits to confidentiality. So we need to, we need to understand our concepts, not foreign concepts like anonymity. And so I look at anonymity is if, if I know who said it, uh, who said uh, something, um, then all I can do for the rest of my life is treat that data as confidential. It's, mm -hmm. it, it can't be anonymous. So that's my, that's my read on that. Mm -hmm. Hence for re uh, ethics review board mm -hmm. to require researchers to address anonymity is impossible. I mean, it's an, it's a requirement that is impossible to meet. Yeah. Just give them this book here. It's, it's the, uh, yeah thank you so much so uh this is now time for us to end and again dr tolik our heartfelt thanks to you uh if you have read the, the expressions of gratitude by our participants they are really very grateful 